All right, so TJ has responded. He has uh, decided to give me the final word, so I want to say thanks to TJ for that. Um, but anyways, let, so let's get into his final response. One of the things I want to substantively address is um, I said I lived in a red state. Uh, he said, um, well, think about Texas. That was a red state until Beto O'Rourke came along. Fair enough, but... We didn't have no Beto O'Rourke in this last election cycle in Louisiana. You know, there was no Beto-esque figure that was going around Louisiana changing hearts and minds. Uh, I don't remember who Steve Scalise's uh, opponent was for his congressional seat, but um, I did look her up a while back to see what she was about. And I found that she, I mean, first of all, she looked like she'd been beaten half to death with the ugly stick. Not that that should matter, but of course it does. Um, another thing is uh, she was borderline illiterate. She had zero charisma. There was no way she was going to even come close to usurping Steve Scalise. And uh, sure enough, she didn't. Uh, he got 75% of the vote or something crazy like that. Huge percent of the vote. Uh, wasn't even a contest. Um, uh, I said that I don't care about Louisiana ballot initiatives. Um, and I, I, I went and looked just now because he's like, you should really know what your ballot initiatives were. And so I decided to go and look and see what was on the ballot uh, that I'd missed out on. And uh, honestly, there are a couple of things here that I might have wanted to vote on. Um, Amendment 1 would prohibit felons from running for office for five years, which I disagree with. I would have voted no, but yes, 1 with 75%. Um, Amendment 2 really blew my mind. It requires a unanimous jury verdict for felony trials. Like, What? That wasn't already the case? What the fuck is wrong with you, Louisiana? Anyway, apparently now it passed. So Louisiana has joined the rest of the civilized world in needing a unanimous jury verdict in felony trials. So yay, I guess. Um, that passed. Uh, and then there's a bunch of stuff that I really don't care too much about. Um, uh, you know, the, the next few amendments are just nothing really important. Those two are the, really the big ones that actually would have mattered to me. And uh, one of them went against me, against how I would have voted. One of them went for how I would have voted. Uh, but based on the numbers, I wouldn't have made a difference in either one of them. So, um, you know, I, me voting no on Amendment 1 wouldn't have stopped it, wouldn't even have come close. Me voting yes on Amendment 2 would not have uh, been a decisive factor. It already won by a comfortable percentage. So uh, it doesn't, it really wouldn't have made a difference. Really wouldn't have made a lick of difference. Um, but I, I do kind of uh, wish I had have known what those were beforehand. I just didn't bother because I knew ultimately I wasn't going to vote. But maybe I should have known. It's a fair enough point. So in the beginning, he starts out by talking about ballot initiatives. Now, I think that the uh, argumentation I provided for ballot initiatives should at least make... TJ alter his position from just staying home and not voting period to okay I'll go vote but I'll just leave whatever I don't agree with blank and vote on at least the ballot initiatives because uh, those are things that are the closest to direct they are basically direct democracy you're literally voting on the issues and they're very important and the ones that he explained he says that yes I would have liked to vote on those um, and so I think he should alter his position he should come out and say, hey, um, I think that, you know, my position now is, no, you should go vote on ballot initiatives because they're direct issues you're voting on, which is very important. But he added the caveat in there. And this is this is like almost like the backbone of all of his argumentation throughout this entire thing, which is that my one vote wouldn't have changed anything. But there's an obviously logical problem with this. If you if you were to implement that idea, then A, no one except for people in swing states would vote. Um, but the probability that your one vote is going to change something is very small. Um, and the problem with that is, is if everyone thought that, then there no longer is a position in which that thing will win. So 
if everyone who voted on those ballot initiatives thought, eh, you know, my one vote, forget ballot initiatives. Think about anything, right? Any single thing. I mean, there are elections where, you know, one vote wins. I remember there's one where there was that one ballot that had decided. I think it was a special election, if I'm not mistaken. Um, maybe one of you guys can let me, remind me about that. But just that alone, the fact that there are barely any elections who have ever existed in which there is one vote to decide it would mean that basically no one should vote because elections don't get decided by one vote. That's just a fact. Um, and so if you and everyone else thought that way, then you would lose every election because people aren't going to go out to vote. It's a terrible, it's a logically, you know, ridiculous idea that you would uh, just because that that one vote would not have altered it that you shouldn't go out to vote. And I think that this might play into TJ's um, overall ideology. I don't know of uh, being, I think he said that he wishes I was more cynical. Um, and so I guess that's just another, I think that he's uh, like just, just wrong about the idea that you should, you know, oh, my vote wouldn't have changed it. So I shouldn't have gone out to vote. I disagree with that. But I guess that's a disagreement amongst inside of a disagreement. Honestly, I don't know at this point. Um, so uh, another thing that you said, that progressive voice said, is that I, uh, if I'm not going to vote, I should, instead of not voting, I should vote third party. And I asked him, well, what the fuck is the point of voting third party? And he said, well, if a third party gets 5% of the vote nationally, then they get federal funding and they're considered a national party at that point. Uh, and he was like, oh, I'm surprised you didn't know that. You're so misinformed. I actually did know that. But it seems like there's something he doesn't know, which is that, or maybe he does know and he just didn't mention it because it looks bad or something. I don't know why it wasn't addressed, but um, the Green Party in the last election, the 2016 election, they got... You know, remember, the, the benchmark for federal funding is 5%. They got to get 5 fucking percent to get there. And the way he frames it, it sounds like, oh, man, if only you had voted for a fucking third party, then we could potentially, they could get 5% of the vote. And it's like, oh, okay. The only problem with that is it's a fucking fantasy. It's a fantasy. Because you know how much, you know what percent of the vote the Green Party got in the last election? It was, uh, what was it, 4%? 4%? No, 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 it wasn't 4%. It was like uh, 3%. No, no, it, actually, it was, it was uh, 2%. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was, it was only 1%. It was only one. Oh, wait, no, actually, you know, I'm forgetting something. I forgot. It was only half of a percent. They only got one half. I'm faking you out again. It's 0.4%. That's the real number. 0.4%. In other words, nowhere fucking near, nowhere even vaguely approaching 5% of the fucking vote. Not even close. Not even close. Not even fucking close. And you know what? Uh, the closest that the Green Party ever got to 5% of the vote was uh, Ralph Nader, who got like 2.5% of the vote. He was the most successful candidate their party had ever seen, and he only got them halfway to where they needed to be to qualify for that federal fucking money and to be considered a national party. And I don't know, maybe even get invited to the debates. Ooh, ah, the debates. Nope, didn't even get halfway there. And you know what? Um, I don't remember, I don't know if, uh, if Progressive Voice is old enough to remember, but... Ralph Nader at the time, after he got that 2.5% of the vote or 2.7 or whatever it was, it was around there, um, he was despised by Democrats. Absolutely despised as a spoiler. Oh my God, you spoiled it. We could have had Gore. We were this close to Gore. But stupid fucking Ralph Nader. Stupid fucking Ralph Nader. So even if I were to go vote for a third party and a third party were to get a significant chunk of the vote, uh, I would still be blamed for, oh my God, we were this close to Hillary. If only, if only you'd voted for Hillary. So it's just a, it's just a shifting of the goalposts, you know? Because um, you're going to get shit. 
if if a third party gets a significant chunk of the vote and the p- mainstream party that's the closest to them loses, then everyone in that party is going to blame those third party people and say, fuck you. You lost us this election, you pieces of shit. How dare you actually vote your conscience instead of voting for the team? All that matters is the team. God damn it. Don't you know that? Um, but um, then he goes on to talk about uh, the Green Party thing, right? Now, the Green Party thing, uh, he says that they got less than half the percent of the vote. That's actually wrong. Um, I don't know why he used wrong information. I'm, I'm just going to assume that it was it was a mistake. Uh, but if you look on, on Wikipedia, it's, it's 1.07% of the vote that they actually got. Um, and so, again, the idea brought is, well, my one vote wouldn't have changed that. So, you know, it's okay that I didn't go out to vote. But, again, that is a logically dumb way to think. Also, you can always, like, people always convince their family members and other people they know to go out to vote. But if everyone thought like you did, then they definitely wouldn't get to 5%. And again, this is hilarious because I'm not even one who uh, is a, a third-party movement guy. And this is what's hilarious about this. This is this is Jimmy Dore's uh, talking, you know? But in this context, it's voting versus non-voting. And i definitely rather have you vote for Green Party than not vote at all. Um, because obviously it could fix our system as well because we'd get out of this duopoly that we're currently in right now. But 1% isn't astronomically far from 5%. 1% is astronomically far from winning an election, no doubt. It's not astronomically far from getting 5%. It's, it's possible if you work towards it. And by the way, the Libertarian Party actually got 3.28% of the vote which is even closer. So a third party can get to that 5% mark. And again, if you're not going to vote, why not use your vote to try to get them up there? Convince people to go out and vote. That's how this process works. And so I don't understand why you wouldn't just go and vote because your vote, it's, you know, it's, it's something you get the ability to do. Why not use it? I don't understand. You're like, it's like being like given something, uh, and just deciding not to use it at all. I don't I don't really understand it. Um, but 5% is totally reachable if people, you know, TJ, TJ constantly made it a point to mention in his first response, uh, or maybe it was his first video, that, you know, there's a huge chunk of the populace that doesn't vote. You're right, TJ. And that, if the, even a small chunk of that, you know, ginormous chunk, a small chunk of that ginormous chunk of the populace were to go vote Green Party or some third party, uh, they would get 5% very easily. And that would jump a lot of hurdles of, of not being able to uh, get out of this duopoly that we're in. Getting third-party candidates on stage for debates is huge. Debates change elections, man. They absolutely change elections. Um, I believe it played quite a big role in the Gore and Bush one as well with the whole lockbox uh, debacle that totally just kind of messed Gore up uh, pretty bad. Now... You can get to that threshold. It's not impossible to get to a 5% threshold. It's entirely possible. They got 1%, not 0.04%. If everyone thought like you did, of course, they're not going to get there. But it's entirely possible. Again, the Libertarian Party got 3.28%. It's entirely possible that they'll hit 5% soon enough. So um, he talks about uh, the Gore-Nader thing. Now, um, he, he he says, you know, was he old enough? No, I wasn't old enough at the time because obviously I was born in 2000. So no, but yeah, I did learn about that when I was around like 15. Um, but in this context, uh, to keep a logical argument going for the people who would be accusing you of being the reason why Gore, uh, Gore lost, it would be in the context of you not voting anyways. So they, the argument would rather be, Hey, you should have voted for the Democrat. My, that's not our argument going on here. Our argument going on here is you should vote for uh, Nader over no one because it's better to vote for Nader than no one. So regardless of what those people say, they're wrong because you wouldn't have voted anyway. So that's, that's sort of the context of what, of what we're talking about. Another thing we disagreed about that I think could actually be talked about in a substantive way is Supreme Court justices. Uh, Now, he says, oh, you know, Trump's going to stack the court with Supreme Court justices and, um, you know, that's a bad thing. Well, I pointed out, and it was never responded to in any substantive way, by the way, that the pendulum is always swinging left and right, left and right. 
And sometimes a president is going to get lucky and they're going to get to appoint a disproportionate amount of fucking Supreme Court justices. And they're going to be able to change the balance of the court. Trump happens to be one of those presidents. But as long as the, the system is the same, as long as our system for appointing the Supreme Court justices remains the same, that's always going to be the case. It's always just going to be a game of musical chairs. And I said, maybe we should look into some way to address that system. And he said, no, we shouldn't do that because then it's just a, a game of political football like everything else where both sides are trying to change it to something that benefits them. Well, how about we just change it to something that doesn't give either side an advantage and is more fair? Maybe something that is, I don't know, responsive to the electorate. Maybe something that people could actually go out and vote for. I don't know. Seems like a good idea to me. Um, <coughs> and then it's not about who's president. It's about which, what people can capture the hearts and minds of the American voters. But we're scared of direct democracy. We always have been. Anyway, one of the things that you said as well is that, you know, if, Trump, if Trump's court gets a hold of a Medicare for all bill, like let's say in the future in 2020, Bernie Sanders wins or some progressive wins, they pass Medicare for all and uh, it becomes the law of the land. And of course the Republicans inevitably issue a constitutional challenge to it. And that goes before the Trump stacked uh, Supreme Court. They're definitely going to strike it down. Definitely going to strike it down because that's just how they fucking are. And we know this is a fact it could be, you could take it to the fucking bank. And I said, you know, a lot of times these conservative justices, uh, they get in there and people think they're going to be super conservative and they're going to, uh, they're going to govern a certain way. And then they just don't, they just don't, they, it, you know, because when they don't, when they're not subject to all the political pressure of needing to climb the ladder, when they've reached the top of the ladder and they're basically the supreme power in the land, then you find out who they really are. And, uh, you know, that argument of mine was not really addressed in a substantive way, but maybe it's because I didn't provide specific examples. So I'd like to provide a few specific examples, a couple of specific examples of that. So the first example I'd like to talk about is Anthony Kennedy. Um, he was appointed to the um, Supreme Court by uh, Ronald Reagan, and he won unanimous confirmation from the United States Senate. Uh, so this is a Reagan appointee to the court. Ronald Reagan, the guy who, when, aid, when the AIDS crisis happened, he basically ignored it to almost a criminal extent and just let um, tons of people die because they were gay. He's just like, I don't care. I don't care if a bunch of fucking gay people die. You know, it's their punishment from God. Fuck them. That was Reagan's attitude. This is his Supreme Court fucking justice. And this is the guy uh, who was just replaced by Brett Kavanaugh, by the way. Um, this is the guy who voted. He was actually the major. He wrote the majority opinion for the case that decided that gay marriage would be the law of the land. You know, Reagan appointee decided that gay marriage should be the law of the land. Uh, another example, more recent example, or um, an example of a more recent appointee anyway, uh, John Roberts, who's the chief justice of the United States uh, Supreme Court. Um, deciding vote and uh, author, once again, of the majority of opinion uh, regarding Obamacare. The constitutionality of Obamacare was challenged, and this ultra-conservative uh, George W. Bush appointed Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court said, nope, Obamacare is constitutional. Sorry. And the conservatives who had been championing him uh, all of a sudden were just like, fuck this guy. Fuck him. He's horrible. We hate him now. Well, why did he vote that way? Why did he vote against his party? Because of legacy. Because he didn't want to be the guy that said, fuck Obamacare. I'm going to kill it. Because he knew it was popular. He knew a lot of people liked it. Uh, at least they liked a lot of the individual provisions of it. Uh, it seems like people like the provisions of Obamacare more than they actually like Obamacare. Go figure. Um, 
So this is, that's two examples of Supreme Court justices appointed by conservative presidents um, who, when it came time to uh, vote on a huge issue that was going to change the face of America forever, both of them said, you know what? Let's go with the liberals on this one. Why? Legacy. That's why. So uh, th- that's a couple of things. Um, I feel like uh, those are the major things I wanted to address in his video. And so he says, I didn't respond to the pendulum swinging. He's actually right. I didn't respond to that. Um, I don't know why I missed that. But, well, I think I thought it was sort of self-explanatory. But, dude, TJ, the pendulum is swinging. Do you know why that pendulum swings? The pendulum swings because people go out to vote. <laughs> so by your logic of not going out to vote, the pendulum stops swinging. There is no more. The pendulum stays. It doesn't move anymore. It's all on the same. It's all on the same ground. If everyone took your ideology and stopped voting and didn't go out to vote until, you know, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders was the candidate, there is no more pendulum swing. It's done. It's over. There's no more pendulum swinging. So it's pretty obvious as to the problem with that. Um, and then he talks about the Supreme Court, right? Now, there are some fundamental problems with what he says about the Supreme Court. Now, one of them being that he says that it needs to be more responsive to the electorate. Now, this is, uh, this is definitely not really a statement that can be corroborated because uh, the Supreme Court is supposed to be uh, not responsive to the electorate. In fact, that's the whole point of the Supreme Court. Uh, this, and this is the arguments that some people have. Well, I, I don't know if they know this or not, but the whole point of the Supreme Court is, and this is the reason why they're appointed by the president and then confirmed by the Senate, uh, the, ju- the justices, is because they're supposed to solely rule based on the Constitution. Now, obviously, this isn't what ends up happening. But if we were to just straight up have it responsive to the electorate, it would be far worse than what we have right now. So, again, uh, it can't be responsive to the electorate. That's totally contradictory to the entire point of the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court is supposed to be apolitical. I know it's not apolitical, but if we were to move in that direction, it would entirely be gone. It would it would be extremely political because then it would just be the will of the people, you know, screw the Constitution, whatever the people think at the time, you know, it is what it is. Now, he also says that there's a way to implement a rule change that is fair to both sides. That's impossible because whichever side implements a rule change, it's going to benefit uh, that side. So when FDR, one of the black marks on his presidency was um, one of the two main black marks, one of them being the Japanese internment camps, the other one being uh, this whole Supreme Court uh, packing plan, is he basically wanted to add more Supreme Court justices and lower the age um, I believe make like an age requirement of like, okay, by this time I can replace you. So these rules are always going to be written in a way that is uh, beneficial um, and helpful and aiding that, you know, that party that puts it in right at that time. Right. So if you put in, let's say a term limit, you know, whatever that term may be, the next time the next party comes in, they're going to lower the term limit. And they're going to make it so that, oh, look, these these couple Democrats are all, are close uh, and we can make them uh, get out by putting in term limits that is at this number. So we're going to do this. Um, another thing that FDR did, it was like he tried adding justices to the Supreme Court. Um, and that is some people, some lefties solution. Um, this is an argument I have with leftists. I don't I fundamentally disagree with the idea of making any Supreme Court changes, rule changes, because, again, it just become a political football, as we saw. Um And so, okay, let's add it, you know, let's make it so that we can have a majority. Well, what happens when the Republicans get in power? They just make it an even bigger number and then make it a majority themselves. And by then, Congress is the same size as the Supreme Court. So the point here being is there is no way to do that because these rules that you uh, think are fair, they're not going to be fair. It just simply uh, isn't possible. And then he brings up the examples of uh, Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy who have been swing votes recently, uh, whether it be on the Obergfell case or whether it be on the Obamacare case. Now, he's right in that. But the thing is, is those people are not analogous to the current people who are being appointed to the court. Uh, Justice Roberts and Kennedy are not as crazy and far right as Gorsuch and Kavanaugh 
and Alito and Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas doesn't even ask questions. He already has his mind made up. I think he's asked one total question. Um, because I guess you can't debate amongst justices during the hearing. And, you know, typically they respond by asking questions to, you know, the, uh, the defendants and the people in the case. He's asked one question. So these people are hardliners. They're not going to... If you think that Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch... Neil Gorsuch is so hardline in his belief system that he's undercut Donald Trump himself because of his ideology uh, that there are going to be swing votes. That's hilarious. And also, there, what happens when a third one gets added? You're talking about those people being one, one swing votes. Now you're going to need like two or three swing votes, which is hilarious. You're not going to get two or three swing votes, buddy. And these people are crazy hardliners. They're not analogous to Roberts or Kennedy who are outliers. These people are the majority. Those two guys were outliers. You're looking at now Alito. You're looking at Clarence Thomas. You're looking at, uh, you know, Gorsuch. You're looking at Kavanaugh. And it's just going to keep adding up and up and up and up. And you're going to keep getting more conservative justices who are going to be hardline um, crazies who, again, are so unbelievably committed to their conservative hardline ideology that they will undercut the president who actually appointed them. Um Anyways, that's pretty much it. Uh, it looks like this is what is going to come to an end. I don't know if TJ is ever going to change his mind on this. I hope he does. I would hope at least he would come out and say that you should go and vote on ballot initiatives. Um, that would be cool. Um, or maybe that, you know, hey, let's try to make a movement to get to that 5% mark. Because if this gi ginormous uh, po percentage of the populace that doesn't vote votes, you know, we can definitely get uh, up to that, uh, you know, that 5% threshold that we need. Or, you know, and well, no, not or. I want to say another point is I'm somewhat sympathetic to what he what he is about, which is, you know, we want candidates who truly support us. I can understand that because uh, the candidates that we have now are pretty damn horrible and, and they're not really representing the, the people. They're, you know, representing their donors and they're not. Uh, advocating the policy positions that we 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 agree on and we support, um, but he is seemingly okay with the opposition taking power, while you know I'm not, and so I guess that's sort of the big disagreement there. But I don't know. Hopefully he will change his mind. Only time will tell. But uh, yeah, thanks for TJ for uh, you know giving his thoughts on this.